All right. Well, welcome, everyone. And thank you so much for attending our monthly Pilina Hour <laughs> webinar series from the College of Natural Sciences. My name is Alison Sherwood. I'm the Interim Associate Dean for the College of Natural Sciences. And through this webinar series, we are aiming to reach the broader community and share the world-class research that happens both within our college and across the Manoa campus. Today's presentation features Dr. David Duffy from the School of Life Sciences within CNS. David Cameron Duffy is the Garrett Parmiel Wilder Professor in the School of Life Sciences at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. He received his AB from Harvard College and PhD from Princeton University. His dissertation was on the guano birds of the Peruvian upwelling, and he's continued his interest in the birds of upwelling areas and their interaction with humans fish stocks and climate over the subsequent four decades. His other research interests have included ticks, fish schools, eastern old growth forests, and mapping Alaska biodiversity. So very diverse fields of research. In Hawaii, he, did, he directed the Pacific Cooperative Studies Unit for two decades. PCSU has created and sponsored research and management throughout um, the Invasive Species Committees and the Watershed Partnerships on each island, as well as projects to manage invasive and endangered species. In recognition of his science and administrative achievements, he was named a 2022 Fellow of the American Academy for the Advancement of Science. Welcome, David. We'll turn it over to you at this point. Thank you. And let's see if I can manage the square, uh, the share screen. Um, whoops. And... Uh, Sorry, um, let me start over. I knew this was going to happen. Oh, oh, because it just, I'm sorry. Um, all right, let's see if this works. So it's not a problem, David, but do you see that share screen icon? There we go. Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> I had put something away that I shouldn't have. <laughs> not a problem. So, uh, here we go. So thank you for inviting me. Um, whoops. Um, my talk today is on the Tao of Pooh, which uh, there was a book of a similar title, but a different subject um, 20 or 30 years ago. And uh, today I'm going to talk about guano and their various euphemisms for guano. I will try to avoid the four letter word one uh, and uh, stick to poo or guano. So anyway, thank you. And uh, today, uh, guano to me started off, I worked on some small islands in Peru. And as I went on, I began to realize how many links these islands had to a lot of events uh, that have uh, shaped the Pacific and actually the whole world. So here are some of them. Uh, sustainability, El Nino, Pacific Islanders, slavery, sugar plantations, Alexander von Humboldt, growth of cities, imperialism, overfishing, and GCAT. I'll be painting with a broad brush. Uh, this could easily be a course, an entire semester. Uh, so I'm going to breeze through things. But let's start with the road to guano. Uh, guano is a fertilizer. And when he, early humans were hunter-gatherers, we didn't really need fertilizer uh, because uh, we weren't planting or growing anything. Then we've moved into shifting cultivation, which we still do in parts of the uh, world. And there you go in and clear some trees, cut down the under, uh, undergrowth, burn it, and you have two or three years of uh, growing conditions before you burn out the soil. We've shifted then to uh, low intensity permanent farming. Uh, and that would include places like Hawaii or uh, early Europe. And so the land you had is what you had to farm. So you had to avoid soil exhaustion. And so we developed uh, 
strategies like leaving fields fallow, not growing anything on them for a while. Mulches, using fish and other fertilizers, uh, and human excretia uh, in a lot of places, especially uh, China was very good at that. But these don't scale up because when we moved into cities, we had high densities of people and high densities of people need a sustained high yield food supply. And uh, we just weren't up to it. We didn't have the fertilizer to do that. Uh, in Britain, the uh, to supply the fields around London, uh, the British were scavenging the battlefields of Europe. They were digging up the bones of soldiers, Waterloo. They were raiding catacombs in different places because they could take the bones back, crush them, and use them as fertilizer. People were using fish waste, but fish waste is perishable, and it's hard to get it from the coast to um, the, the fields where they're needed. And human waste, mostly we flushed it down to the rivers. And so uh, we couldn't use, we didn't use that. But let's talk about guano. The, this is the 19th century strategic mineral. This is the oil of the 19th century, or perhaps the uranium of the, uh, the uh, would have been the equivalent of uranium or oil. It, is, it was the strategic mineral that made things happen. And the story starts with Humboldt, um, Alexander von Humboldt, who to me was crossed between Einstein and Indiana Jones. And uh, Humboldt walked across Northern uh, um, South America from uh, Venezuela to Peru, which involved climbing a whole bunch of, of uh, volcanoes, uh, lugging heavy equipment with them to measure their height. And he took copious notes and he collected all sorts of things. He was really just an amazing person, uh, a genius. And uh, one of the things he brought back, brought back uh, was guano. He was down in the docks on the coast of Peru, and there were some really smelly barges. <laughs> and he asked, because Humboldt asked everybody everything, he asked, why are you bringing all this stinky stuff here? And, and they said, it's great fertilizer. And so he brought some back to Europe. And in due time, chemists began to investigate uh, its makeup and uh, farmers began to experiment with it. And so let's have a side uh, thing about what is guano. There are three ways it was creating uh, waste from uh, most animals. If you live in an aquatic environment, you can use ammonia. Ammonia, which uh, is highly liquid and takes a lot of liquid to, to get out of you. Mammals, um, it's urea, which is a sort of intermediate. But things like birds and insects, land snails, they don't have that much water to waste. So uh, they excrete their waste products with uric acid. And uric acid is sort of like, uh, I'd say a toothpaste. Uh, it's and it's not very soluble in water, it, but it doesn't use water. And it's, it's really sort of sticky stuff. And so uh, it's also, in the case of seabirds, it, it turns out it's a really good fertilizer. Uh, for those of you who are gardeners, you may know the ratio of nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium, NPK. And in the organic fertilizers, Bone meal, which was what uh, Britain was trying to run its crops off of, has a ratio of, of three nitrogen to 15 uh, um, phosphorus to zero uh, potassium. And nitrogen gives you lots of green vegetation. Uh, phosphorus will give you roots, strong roots and, and fruits. And potassium is good for uh, general health. So bone meal, 315, zero. Fish meal, uh, 860. Bat guano, which was another thing they were trying to use, but didn't have enough guano, uh, bats, uh, was 731. When people started analyzing guano, they found it was just awesome. It was 1212. And it was also loaded with, amazing, with a lot of uh, other nutrients, 
And so for gardening, for uh, farming, it was an incredibly powerful fertilizer. <clears throat> now, um, we know there are a lot of, well, there are a lot of seabirds and they produce an enormous amount of, of guano or poo. Um, and it's supposed to be pretty valuable. But what people uh, have ignored is location. Where the guano occurs uh, makes them useful and valuable. So this is a, a blue-footed booby in, in Peru, uh, sorry, in the Galapagos, and you'll see a ring of guano. And so you have low densities of nesting, you have low uh, output of guano, and so it really doesn't affect most of the ecosystem except right around a nest. Here in Hawaii, this is at the marine base at the uh, red-footed booby colony. Uh, it's a lot denser and there's a lot more poo, but there's also a lot more rain. And so a lot of this runs off into the ocean. And we now know from repeated studies that coral reefs benefit from uh, on a, a small islands from having guano birds around because of the fertilizer they dump into the system. But the, the uh, place where you get accumulations of guano are in highly dense, uh, dry areas of high density nesting that are dry. And so this is an island off of Peru. And there's this really distinctive, I don't know what you call the color, sort of a, uh, I'm not an artist, a, sort of an off-white beige. And that's the color of fresh guano. And guano accumulates in these, uh, these places because there's no rain. Closer to home on Laysan Island, uh, there were large accumulations of guano. It didn't rain much, uh, but they were slow accumulations because the birds weren't that dense, even though albatrosses are big and they produce a lot of guano. So on the lower right, you can see a lot of uh, elegant gentlemen uh, scraping up the guano from the surface and then trucking it away. And uh, once it was gone, it was done once, it was gone uh, and we've never had that much guano again. Uh, once they got rid of the guano, uh, they then turned to eggs. And then uh, as the eggs gave out, uh, they started taking feathers off the uh, albatross adults and uh, putting the young in pots to let them starve so that it was easier to pull off their feathers. And so by the end of this, you had a complete ecological meltdown. But this is not a way you run a sustainable uh, harvest of anything. The best guano deposits uh, were on the west sides of continents in what are called upwellings. And uh, it could take a long time to explain this, but basically uh, the wind blows along shore toward the equator. And this pulls uh, the water away from the shore dragging up colder uh, and nutrient-rich water uh, to the surface where plankton gets hold of it because there's light. And so you get um, very productive ecosystems. In contrast, uh, say here in Hawaii, we have blue water. There's not much productivity in it. There's not much in the way of nutrients and those are rapidly eaten by, recycled by, uh, little beasties. And so we have long food chains that tend to be very efficient from microplankton uh, to dinoflagellates to crustaceans to small fish to larger fish to even larger fish and then to birds. It's a great diversity in the food web, but it's not concentrated in, in any one uh, group. But upwellings, uh, when that nutrient water comes up, the diatoms, which are very good at taking advantage of that. And so they grow like crazy. And uh, the diatoms get harvested by fish. And these those fish are harvested by birds or whales or top predators. And these ecosystems tend to be uh, dominated by a single fish species, either an anchovy or a sardine. 
So upwellings can support greater biomass at, at higher trophic levels than the long chains in the blue water. And there's one upwelling that is the upwelling. It's uh, so massive. Uh, sorry, here's the California one. It's comparatively small, where the Humboldt current, named after our hero, uh, is one that sweeps uh, almost the entire length of, of the west coast of, of um, South America. And it's dominated or was dominated by a single species of fish, anchoveta, which occurs in immense uh, schools and uh, basically uh, vacuums up the uh, diatoms as, as fast as they grow. So it's a single species dominance. And on the bird side, uh, things are dominated by the guanai cormorant. Uh, guanai and guano come from the, uh, are very similar because they come from the same origin. And uh, the guanai cormorants uh, feed or fed in the tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. Uh, they did everything in en masse. And that was, the scale of the ecosystem was just so much bigger than we're used to elsewhere. This is a feeding frenzy. Uh, and uh, so it was just a main species of bird uh, dominating the exploitation of a single uh, fish. Uh, for guanais on land, they nest in very dense uh, congregations basically just out of beak level, beak distance of one another. So they can jab at each other, but not really hit. There's another species that's almost, that's lesser importance, uh, less common, but uh, equally important is the Picaro or Peruvian booby. And the, uh, you could, with the cormorants, they dive from the surface to go after Anchevetta, but uh, the boobies, uh, dive sometimes from 30, uh, 30 feet or more into the water uh, to chase the um, anchovy. And they return to nest, uh, and their nests are made almost exclusively of guano, either their own, which they squirt out onto the nest surface, or they grab little bits of guano from other people's nests and incorporate it in theirs. And so this is a uh, booby nest. Um, it's five or more pounds of, of guano. Uh, and imagine hundreds of thousands of nests like this. There's a third species. Um, this is the Peruvian pelican. It's uh, not the same pelican you're used to on the mainland. This one's much bigger. And uh, it's so buoyant that unlike the brown pelicans on, on the continent, this thing cannot plunge into the water. It would be like trying to plunge a beach ball into the water. So instead what they do is they sit on the surface at night and grab fish, or during the gay day, they land in the middle of the cormorants and grab a cormorant and force it to regurgitate. And so this is sort of a, a it's a beautiful species. It's a nuisance though, in terms of guano. Here's a nesting uh, area. The, in this case, the pelicans have moved in, cleared out the guanai cormorants, and are nesting in the middle of a, what used to be a very nice guanai colony. But notice the white, notice the, just the amount of bird poop going into the system. So um, in Peru and in all the upwelling areas, there are a limited number of places where you're uh, away from uh, four-legged predators. And so here is, uh, I don't know how many, 50,000 or more uh, pelicans, uh, guanais, the darker birds, and they live on the windward side, the, the windy slopes. And up here in the slightly warmer places, less wind, are the uh, boobies. And they just cover, um, cover an island. Uh, there's no rain, they're dense nests, and so you have tons and tons of guano. And the early Peruvians uh, exploited guano. Uh, there's a sort of controversy. Uh, we know that a local uh, Peruvians near the shore uh, took guano from the islands, 
and used it in their fields. But their claims that the entire Inca empire was based on guano uh, that was taken off of these islands. Um, so we're still trying to figure out the, the uh, Incas and others did not have big boats. They were made of reeds. Uh, so we, we're not sure how they got to shore. And llamas, which were supposed to transport the guano, uh, don't can't really carry immense loads. So the idea that uh, you had tens of thousands of, of llamas transporting guano from Lake Titicaca to um, the Ecuadorian border is hard to imagine, but then we don't really know much. But we do know that the Peruvians valued it. And soon uh, Europe and America valued their guano uh, and the great guano rush was on. And here's one of the three islands that uh, were at the uh, uh, heart of this, the Chincha Islands uh, in central Peru. And there are different measurements, uh, but in some of these, they exceeded 40 meters, uh, 120 feet or more of guano accumulation. And so a lot of biologists have spent a lot of time trying to figure out uh, how old this guano is. And uh, these are our uh, Chinese uh, workers who, well, I'll talk about how they got there, but uh, they were relatively short. And you can see perhaps a little striation um, in the uh, guano. And so a lot of us have spent a lot of time trying to figure out how uh, we assume each uh, layer is a different uh, year. So how many uh, years would it take? And it's complicated because halfway down one of these piles, uh, we found Mochica artifacts, uh, ceramics. And so we know pretty much roughly when they would have been put there. And we even found a Spanish emblem, which we would know pretty much exactly when it was put there. And so a lot of this guano uh, accumulated uh, relatively recently, uh, but the current thinking is that we're looking at 3,000, we're looking at 3,000 years of, of birds pooping in a dry environment. And so uh, folks went to work. This was a gold mine or a guano mine. And you can see them busy, uh, they were busy stripping layers down uh, and by wheelbarrow, loading them into a train system, which then took the uh, guano down to the coast and loaded it into ships. The whole system was amazingly inefficient because people were hiring these sailing ships uh, and assuming they could go and make a fortune in no time. But uh, the uh, loading of guano uh, was dependent on weather and on bureaucrats. And so ships could spend months and months sitting at uh, an anchor waiting for a load of guano to take back to England. Uh, and there was a lot of bribery involved to get yourself at the uh, head of the queue. Uh, but uh, a lot of it still, uh, the guano was gone in 30 years. And uh, 3000 years of guano basically vanished um, and went off to uh, feed the farms in, in America and in Europe. The gold rush was over. Uh, about 10 years into the gold rush, uh, the United States got worried that uh, we were going, the British sort of had a lock on, on the Peruvian islands. And so the United States decided what they needed to do was to uh, get our own islands. And so Congress passed an act that uh, if you were an American citizen and you found an island that did not belong to anyone uh, and it had guano, you could claim it. The United States would recognize that as territory and defend your right to extract guano uh, from everybody. Uh, it turned out that a lot of uh, enthusiastic Americans began to claim islands that uh, belonged to other countries or had already been claimed. And so there was a lot of uh, stories of, of 
uh, folks arriving and then being uh, thrown off of the islands by uh, a uh, say British warships because it was already English or French because it was French. Uh, but this was a significant, <coughs> excuse me, the act is significant because uh, up till then, the US had really been focusing on uh, moving westward. And this was the first time that the US began to see itself basically sort of as an imperialistic power taking over places uh, so that we could bring resources back to the country. Closer to home, uh, two islands on, around the equator, Howland and Jarvis, uh, were claimed under this act by two local gentlemen from Honolulu, uh, Benson and Judd. And uh, they proceeded to claim the islands uh, in the name of the American Guano Company um, and to exploit the guano, uh, take the guano off the islands. And so now there's no layer, there's no guano left. There are birds, but um, it's gonna take a couple of thousand years to get back to where it was. The interesting thing is that guano for a good period of that time was what uh, fertilized the sugar plantations, that and bone meal. We didn't have other fertilizers to, for sugar. And so guano was a heaven sent uh, contribution to the uh, plantation economy. In 1913, uh, the party ended, well, the guano was gone. And we had found guano on almost any, every isolated island that might have some. And so the islands were bare and uh, we were running into a problem. In 1913, Fritz Haber uh, invented a way of, of a chemical reaction that took nitrogen out of the air and turned it into a fertilizer. That's something that could be used for fertilizer. It could also be used to make explosives. Uh, so Fritz received a Nobel prize in 1918 for chemistry. Meanwhile, between 1913 and 1918, you may notice that was during First World, World War. And Haber was the mastermind for the German use of chemical weapons. And he was more or less directly responsible for killing tens of thousands of, of soldiers. Uh, and then three years later, he turned around and got a Nobel Prize. And in, in fairness, uh, the introduction of artificial fertilizer um, probably saved millions of people from uh, uh, starvation. But uh, so he's a war criminal and a uh, hero. Um, and uh, so it's one of the many ironies about uh, guano and fertilizers. So let's talk about the human cost of guano. Um, in 1855, after the uh, rush had been going, uh, Peru used its guano income to free its slaves. Uh, and like the British, uh, they paid the owners for their slaves to free them. Uh, they didn't pay the slaves for having been slaves. They just turned them loose on a landscape. Uh, this is sort of similar to what Britain did, where they bought the slaves from uh, rich folks and then gave rich folks more money, which in that case was often plowed back into development. Peru, it, nothing much, uh, the money went to folks and just sort of disappeared into things. So without slaves, they were left with a limited number of convicts. And so some very dark things happened at that point. They needed people to work the islands. No one in their sane mind was going to work there. Um, and so um, Chinese laborers that thought they were going to go to California and risk their lives building uh, railroads or farming uh, suddenly found themselves on ships going to Peru. And the, uh, the Peruvian islands had had such a horrible reputation that many of those uh, future laborers just jumped over, overboard as soon as they knew where they were going. Once they got to the islands, uh, they were overworked, uh, the environment was horrible, and uh, 
many of them, there, there are a couple of stories of a number of them joining hands and then jumping as a group off the cliffs because they, they just couldn't stand it. Uh, if you look at the history of Rapa Nui, Easter Island, a uh, ship arrived and basically took the entire population up to Peru, uh, and relatively few came back when they were rescued by a, uh, uh, I guess, either British or French warship that wondered where they'd gone and brought them back. So they got up there, they died of disease, or they died of just uh, on the islands. Uh, same thing with Polynesians, uh, blackbirding, a ship would arrive and grab a whole bunch of people from an island and take it back to um, the Guano Islands. Hawaii, it was, people, uh, Hawaiians were not taken to the Peruvian Islands, but uh, most of the Hawaiians were fluent and literate in Hawaiian. We had lots of newspapers. We had high literacy rate in Hawaiian. The contracts were written in Hawaiian and they were written in English. The trouble is they did not agree. And the Hawaiian contracts sounded great. The, the uh, English contracts, English language contracts uh, were actually pretty nasty. So Hawaiians got to some of the islands like Howland or others, and they were not what they'd signed up for. Finally, there were two wars of the Pacific. Uh, Peru defended its Guano Islands against Spain, and then Chile and Peru uh, and Bolivia fought a series of wars over other guano resources. And as a result, Bolivia lost its access to the sea. So all these things were churning uh, the human products of, of byproducts of this uh, guano rush. By the end of the century, um, people had been uh, sitting on the islands grabbing uh, the last guano. And uh, uh, so it was hard to nest, and uh, if you nested, uh, they would feed you to the uh, the workers. And if you've ever eaten cormorant, that's not a nice thing. Uh, so by the turn of the century, guano bird populations were very low. The islands were essentially useless, and so the companies that had been controlling them turned them over to Peru. And then something neat happened. Uh, the Peruvians realized that they had to change how things had been done. And so in 1909, they created the Compañía Administradora del Juano, which uh, decided that uh, they would have to grow the guano bird population and treat the resource as sustainable. So uh, they put guards on uh, a whole, I think it was 40 islands, along the whole coast, keeping people from landing on them and they're protecting the birds. Uh, here's the island I worked on. And uh, this is more recent guano here, but you can see the uh, earthworks, the stoneworks that were created to uh, keep the guano from falling into the sea. And so it was a, they were farming uh, birds for the first time, not mining them. Uh, here's another view. Each of the island had a uh, uh, guard post like this with a way of landing. Uh, they needed to provide water to the uh, the guards on the islands and food. Uh, and when they uh, harvested the guano, oh, sorry. And then uh, they were thought about it and they realized the guano birds spend time on the mainland on coastal headlands. So let's build some walls and see what happens. So they built these walls to keep foxes and people and cats and dogs out. And uh, sure enough, uh, this is Punta San Juan, which is sort of a, now a major lab for guano burke work. The fence roughly runs along like this. And you can see these darker areas are fresher guano. And this colony exploded. It was basically as big as any of the uh, Guano Islands. And I, not ironically, but right across the uh, fence, the wall, uh, there was the town of San Juan. So uh, with a fishing fleet here. And uh, 
So when once they did this, they found that the number of guano birds starting in the 40s when they started fencing, the, the number of guano birds exploded from about 4 million to 20 million. Uh, and the amount of guano they harvested uh, kept increasing. So it was a win-win treating a resource sustainably. And that's a, one of the early uh, non-indigenous uh, efforts at uh, sustainable management. So nowadays uh, they harvest the guano, they do it when the birds are not nesting. Uh, it's tough, dirty, smelly work, uh, but the uh, guards have decent places to live. And a lot of them come from the high Andes. And so this is one of the few sources they have of hard income. They also feed them uh, as much as they could eat and mostly a lot of cow, uh, beef. And so it's a hard life, but uh, these are folks that are used to hard lives up in the Andes. Uh, they get down and this is, guy's got a uh, broom and they're basically scraping up every bit of guano from the ground. And then it's put into sacks and uh, taken down. Uh, they filter, screen it, and then they take it to market and they'll sell it. In the back, you can see non-nesting boobies. Um, and so it was a sustainable system that worked as opposed to the uh, mining of the previous century. So in the past, they would get uh, sometimes, in the last century, up to 200,000 tons or more would be taken out. Now it's only 20 or 30,000 tons. Uh, and instead of it being exported, <clears throat> three quarters is used for local agriculture up in the Andes and 25% is exported. For those of you after, who are inspired after this uh, to go out and, and uh, buy yourself some Peruvian guano, uh, here's 12112, uh, <clears throat> it's 90 bucks for 15 pounds on Amazon. And when I was a grad student, I had the great idea, why don't I export this stuff to, to the United States and sell it at really great markup prices uh, to the organic farming uh, industry. And then a friend took me aside and said, David, you know, if you're gonna start exporting a white powder in large amounts to the United States, uh, this may not go over well with the authorities. Uh, or if you're not careful, you'll have folks that will convince you to uh, hide another white powder in the guano so you can bring it in. So my visions of glory uh, of being a tycoon uh, faded. So uh, another by pro one of the other byproducts of uh, the uh, guano company was uh, realizing that uh, every couple of years, we knew this, but every couple of years, uh, the birds would stop nesting. They'd either migrate or they would die. And this is a local observation of, of something that we called El Nino. And uh, basically in normal years, uh, we have upwelling, we have uh, air that circulates at high altitudes, comes back to the coast and uh, then goes offshore causing the upwelling. As the air dries, it just, uh, becomes warmer. And so it's sucking uh, moisture out of the air, which is why you have deserts on the west coast of continents. In an El Nino, the whole system reverses. And so suddenly you have uh, the air rising uh, and as it rises, it's dumping moisture. And the desert suddenly has rain, the desert suddenly has thunderstorms and flooding. And the currents have reversed and so there's no upwelling <laughs> and the place turns into, the ocean turns into a desert. And I think we're gonna hear a lot more about this in the next week or so, because their uh, their projections seem to be that we're about to have another El Nino and this one could be a very strong one. 
and for for Hawaii, the one of the uh, things to to note is when you get all this warm water on the east side of the Pacific, that's a really good time to have hurricanes. So we may be in a hurricane season during El Nino. During El Nino, the anchovy disappear. Um, they don't live for very long. And so uh, they may not reproduce and that causes the population to decrease. Uh, they certainly go down uh, deeper than the birds can get it. And so the birds desert in the thousands, the hundreds of thousands, even the millions. And in a bad El Nino, the birds die by the millions. And uh, they, this can, you can have 40 or 50 miles of coast with just dead guanai after dead guanai. And it looks pretty bad, but uh, once people started studying it, they realized a couple of things. El Nino has happened a lot, but uh, after an El Nino, the environment snaps back to being very productive. So guano birds turn out to be adapted to a boom bust uh, environment. They may die, but the ones who come back uh, and survive will start breeding again and even can produce two clutches a year. So the population recovers rapidly. Um, and whoops. So if we look at the um, El Nino records, uh, they're very frequent and they really didn't have much effect uh, on the guano birds uh, up until the 1960s. This was management of the islands by the guano company. There was a big El Nino then uh, afterwards. And then as new uh, headlands were walled off, the population just kept growing. They would uh, fall, the population would fall, but then recover. So this was a local problem in Peru, but now we know it's a local concern. Uh, hurricanes, flooding, drought in uh, Brazil and Africa, uh, they're all connected to this change in the Pacific. So uh, the university has got a lot of people working on this, and it's been one of the leaders of, of El Nino research uh, for decades. So Gua, uh, El Nino was a problem, but then uh, it, a bigger problem uh, arose. 1957, uh, the California sardine industry had collapsed. And they had a bunch of net, cheap nets and factories that they wanted to unload. And so someone bought a bunch of the nets uh, and a factory and they uh, started a anchovy fishery directly rather than going through the birds, they caught the anchovies. Um, and uh, the anchovies were not intended for human food. Uh, at most, they've been 1% of the catch. Anchovies are a little bit hard to consume, although if you're a Peruvian in the high Andes, uh, this is a pretty nice uh, protein source, and it's an acquired taste. But it's only 1%. Uh, the other 99% uh, was ground up into fish meal uh, in these factories. They would cook it up, take the water out, take the fat out, and then you had this nice powder, uh, which humans can't eat. And um, it was almost all exported. Uh, Peruvians didn't have much use for it. And so uh, fish meals used for aquaculture, uh, that salmon you eat may be uh, originally an anchoveta. Uh, it's used for pet food, poultry, a whole lot of other things. And in the hard economics, um, it's much more valuable as fish meal than as guano or than human uh, food. And so um, the Peru saw a good thing. And so they went uh, into it and they started building boats, an incredible number of boats, way more than there were fish to harvest. And so they basically had up more 50% or more too many boats to have a sustainable fishery. And uh, it turns out also that uh, the anchovy responds to El Nino 
and the politicians didn't understand that. They figured, uh, oh, if it's harder to fish, you just fish more. And so uh, when the El Nino years, when the anchovy were vulnerable, they kept fishing and uh, the uh, result was some crashes. In fairness to them, uh, building all these boats and creating a new fishery had pro provided a lot of jobs. And uh, so if you had a fishery that stopped fishing, you had a whole lot of really angry fishermen in coastal towns. And that was not what the Peruvian government wanted. So they basically said, kept fishing, keep fishing. And here's what happened. Uh, this is the bird's eye view. Uh, this is, um, these are El Ninos. And uh, so the bird population was at that point, say 12 million. There was a uh, uh, El Nino um, and the birds recovered rapidly. But at the same time, starting in, I guess, 56 or so, the uh, anchovy fishery took off and the birds never recovered to the level they were before, but the fishery kept growing. So in 1965, that was a uh, year that it happened. There was an El Nino, the fishery kept fishing, uh, the birds collapsed and the birds never recovered and the fishery kept growing until the next El Nino when they collapsed and um, had this period of not much in the way of anchovy, not much in the way of guano birds, and not much in the way of a fishery. They did start to come back and periodically, about every 10 years, the anchovy come back and tend to be overfished because they are highly volatile their population size varies. And so if you have an industry that has to fish, they will fish every time or outfish every time. So uh, that's uh, the story of, of Peru <clears throat> and its upwelling and its anchovy and its guano birds. But there's uh, a couple of players lurking in the back. Uh, when I was working in Peru, I saw one blue whale in five years. Now they're much commoner. Uh, uh, fur seals and sea lions were, uh, fur seals were just really rare. I saw one, uh, a predecessor of mine, never saw a single one except that a condor regurgitated a fur seal uh, when he shot the condor. Uh, this was back in the twenties. So they were very rare. The sea lions were rare, um, and then they've been coming back. And so uh, at the back of our minds is maybe there were so many uh, anchovy because our earlier efforts had almost exterminated the whales, uh, taken the fur seals for their fur and uh, killed off the sea lions. They're coming back. What is that gonna do to anchovy populations? And then, can the fishery manage to uh, not screw it up again? So finally, I'd just like to close with uh, a uh, uh, sort of a neat thing. Uh, guanine was isolated in uh, 1846, and it was a chemical that was uh, isolated from uh, a bunch of guano. And uh, in the fullness of time, Watson and Crick when they were looking at discovering the uh, structure of, of DNA, the double helix, there are uh, uh, mixtures of uh, the links uh, that hold the helix together are adenine, thymine, and guanine, cysteine, uh, cyt cytosine. And so uh, it may be, we need to be a little bit humble that uh, there's a little bit of guano in all of us and in, in basically all life. So I'd like to close with that. And if you have any questions, uh, I'd be happy to answer them. Great, thank you so much, David. We really appreciate you talking with us today. Um, so our floor is open for questions. There was one that came in through the chat partway through your um, talk, and I think you addressed it when you're talking about El Nino, but just in case you have something else to add, 
Uh, Daryl's asking, why did guano bird population on Punta San Juan crash in the 1960s? That would have been in the 65. And I guess it was just that was the uh, period when uh, the fishery started to take so much that the birds couldn't compete. Um, during that period, a lot of islands uh, became vacant. And instead of having 40 islands that were occupied at the peak, um, at some points, you would only have three or four that had large populations. And um, we, we think that uh, if the populations of guanais get to small enough, uh, their colonies just don't succeed and they collapse. And so there are a few island, super islands, uh, but a lot of the other islands now are just empty. Virginia, did you have a question? Yeah, well, thank you. That was fascinating. I'm, I'm curious about the fact, I used to work with uh, guano too because of isolating influenza viruses uh, oh. from birds, particularly migratory birds. And I, I had two questions. One, um, is there any concern about the microbe, microbes that might be in the guano uh, for people or for other animals? And then also, is there any way to have a sustainable culture of guano? Well, first, uh, there... I can't remember their names. Um, they were in, in Colorado, I think. And uh, um, they and Harry Hoogstrol worked together uh, to find viruses. And they uh, we collected ticks for them and other people collected ticks. And there were three or four viruses, Wacho, Salinas, and I can't remember the other. Uh, and... Uh, they're there, we don't know what they do. Uh, but uh, at some points, the care for the guano workers was not very good. And so there's a wonder whether some of them got these viruses um, and suffered from that, or if they just suffered from, say, cuts and bruises and uh, that got infected. Uh, there, a more common thing that I know personally is a problem is there's a lot of histoplasmosis in that system. And so I've got histoplasmosis. It's safely locked up, I'm told, uh, unless my immune system crashes, uh, in which case it'll come out and kill me. But I'm not planning on that anytime soon. And I guess it's too complicated to get rid of it. So histoplasmosis, a series of viruses, uh, and uh, we don't really know much more than that. That was a long-winded long -winded way of saying we don't know. So, oh, but your other question was, uh, how would you manage going into the future? And this is, uh, well, if there's a will to do it, uh, we have multi-species modeling that was developed in the North Sea and uh, with South Africans upwelling. And so um, if we could agree on how the pie should be divided up between birds, marine mammals, uh, and humans, uh, we could in theory start to try to manage that. But um, what makes it so difficult is every time an El Nino comes along, that may reshuffle sorry, we shuffle the deck or change the size of the, uh, the pie. And so, uh, but the first thing is there has to be a political will uh, again to say rain in the fishery. Um, oh, and now also we have tourism. And uh, now that the uh, terrorist troubles are, are fading, um, some of these islands have become, become quite attractive to tourism. So that would require that we have birds around or fur seals. So uh, the good news is that there is this young bunch of highly, really smart Peruvian scientists, and they're redoing a lot of my work and, and uh, much better than I could. They've got better techniques. And so uh, we're in learning a lot more about the system than uh, when I did it or other people uh, 80 years ago. So we have more knowledge and hopefully we can do a better job this time. 
Hello. Other questions for David? Well, David, I wanted to ask you whether um, whether there's much of a market at this point, given that there's also <coughs> synthetic fertilizers. Are there certain groups or types of farming that really gravitate towards the, the natural guano? A lot of organic gardening. Uh, the synthetic uh, fertilizers are missing a lot of the micronutrients that uh, uh, organic uh, fertilizers have. And guano is the sort of the king of the micronutrients, uh, as well as being a powerful fertilizer. So if you want to do organic gardening, uh, there's a, a big market for uh, these organic fertilizers. Uh, that makes sense. Thank you. Um, oh, one just one thing is that it's so powerful that you've got to use it right. Otherwise, you could take out your lawn. So uh, it's uh, it's it's more it's as powerful as some of the artificial ones. Very good, thank you, Rob. You have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, there's some sort of uh, jet outside my window that it's uh, afterburners on right now, so you might be able to hear that. Um, one of the reasons I am an astronomer is because I don't like to step in guano or smell it. But I was wondering what. Why did people have the idea that it was good for fertilizer in the first place? All the pictures you showed of guano islands are basically barren with nothing growing on them. I think it was uh, when Humboldt came back and said, hey, the Peruvians are using this stuff. And people were really desperate for uh, some leads on fertilizer. And then at the same time, you had sort of the birth of, not the birth, but the flowering of uh, chemistry going on and experiments by chemists, uh, not just in the lab, but in the field. Liebig, uh, God, who's the, uh, his, some of his work on the, the law of the minimum came out of, of uh, working on fertilizers. And it was Davy, uh, another chemist, was involved in this sort of test. So chemists were much more hands on. Uh, and things were much simpler then. And this was a major uh, need to try to figure out guano or figure out fertilizer. Very good. Well, I think at this point, we will wrap up our Q&A session. I'd like to extend a final thank you to David for speaking with us today. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you being here and um, sharing this really interesting sort of historical perspective on how such a seemingly mundane topic can be so wrapped up into global politics. Yeah. Thank you all for attending as well. It's great to see you. We look forward to seeing everybody soon. Um, our final event for this academic year is going to be held on Wednesday, May 17th at 2 p.m. It's going to feature Dr. Karen Meach from the Institute for Astronomy. So watch your email inboxes for your invitations to that event. Have a wonderful rest of your day or evening. It's great to see everyone again. Aloha.